Okay, uh, let's uh, get started. So, Prashant is not here, so I'm making up for the class. Uh, my name is Prateek, and please, please feel free to ask any questions. So today is a bit of a hectic class. We will cover uh, VM migration, the part that was left out from last class. We are going to look into distributed communication and how distributed systems and entities within distributed systems can communicate with each other. Uh, we are going to focus on remote procedure calls or RTCs and that's going to be the main focus of today's talk. So just to recap from last time, uh, we have live migration, I hope people remember what that's about. Uh, so the main idea is you want to transfer a virtual machine from you know, one physical host to another physical host uh, without significant amount of downtime for the application. So let's go at a more fundamental level, right? What the problem that we're going to solve is move virtual machine state. Right? It's a virtual machine, so it has virtual CPUs, it has some virtual memory, it has virtual I/O devices. You're going to move that state from you know, one machine to another over the network. So the trivial way of doing that is to just, you know, freeze the virtual machine and stop all the applications from executing, and just copy all that state to a different host. Right? But that will impact the application. So, if, for example, the virtual memory size is 128 gigabytes. You want to move 128 GB over Ethernet to a different machine. So live migration does this by incrementally and iteratively copying application state. And more specifically, we are interested in how do you move memory state from one machine to another. So last time, I think Prashant covered the pre-copy algorithm. Does that ring a bell? All right, some nods. In which case, the whole goal is that you want to, as the application is executing, you, you are continuously copying the pages over the network to a different machine. Um, that's one way. Right? So once your remaining state is small enough, you can then sort of stop the VM and execute it on a different machine. That's only one way of doing migration. The other way is called post copy. And let's see if I can il il illustrate this in pictures better. So this is our time axis. And you start over here, the VM is on your source host, right? So what does pre-copy do? Right? So in pre-copy, remember the VM is executing, which means that its state is changing. You know, it's, right? So application is writing some pages, writing some disk pages, some disk blocks. Right? So this iteratively pre-copy spends a lot of time on copying the VM state, right? So you are And if you are more specific, if you break it down, you want to first copy the memory state. And here we are assuming that the disk state is shared over the network, right? like NFS or a SAN or something like that. So this goes on for a long time, right? And then your all you are left to do is basically copy your vCPU or CPU state. This point, right. once this is done, at this point, you can now start running on your destination. So this is the sort of high level view of your sort of pre-copy. It's called pre-copy because you're first copying your state, more specifically your memory state, and then you're running on, on the destination. Right? So for this point, you're still running on the source. Right? The VM is still running on the source. So now we come to post-copy. In which it's kind of flipped around a bit. 
you still start over here. What you're going to do is you're going to first copy the vCPU state. You're going to first copy the vCPU state, right? You'll be done at this point. And then at this point, you start running on the destination. Right? And that's it. Is it? No. I mean, so, you know, your memory state is still there. So if you look at it from another pictorial example, Here, what we are doing is this is your source, your destination. You have moved your VCPU state here, but your memory state is still on the source, right? And you know, you have some network access over VCPU. So the idea now is that once you start executing on the remote remote destination, you know, page in all this memory, right, over the network as you're running. So the VM can now spend a lot of time basically, you know, copying memory from you know, the source to the destination. And once all that memory has been copied in, then you know the migration is set to be completed. This makes sense. Uh, pre and post copy. So there are two techniques. Uh, on most hypervisors, you find an implementation of pre copy. Uh, so they have different trade offs in terms of how immediate you are able to move to a different server. In pre-copy, you know, this can take a long time, tens of minutes, let's say, if your RAM size is very big. So you won't start executing on the destination until much later. In this case, you start executing immediately. But at this point, right, when you're running over here, right, when you're executing instructions here, they're referencing memory pages which are found over here, right? Every new page has to be first copied over the network. So as pages are being accessed by our application, you're going to be doing a copy on access over network to your destination. So the performance of VMs in this state while they're being migrated, you know, is different in both uh, pre and post copy. Because in pre copy, you're still making local memory accesses. Whereas in post copy, you're making remote memory accesses during the period of the migration. Questions? Yeah. What happens if the memory changes during copy? Like the source is still running, right? Mm -hmm. So if it takes tens of minutes, the memory can change. Talking about know, the pre-copy case? Yes. Right. So that's a good question, right? So the key point with pre-copy is that you are doing iterative copy of memory pages. So right, that the memory can change while it's doing, right? So you don't copy it once. In fact, I have a small example here. So the fundamental problem is that, uh, all right, what's the network bandwidth for Ethernet? Huh? 100 megabits, okay, one Gbps, all that, right? What's memory bandwidth of your PCI bus? Kind of close, yeah. It's in, several hundred gigabits per second, right? Which is several orders of magnitude more than your network bandwidth. So the application can always, you know, make a lot of memory state changes in the time it takes you to set that. So the key advantage, so the key properties that pre-copy uses are two. First of all, you're going to do a lot of writes, but you only send one memory page at a time. Those writes are absorbed. And secondly, if you're familiar with the concept of working set of programs, so program may have access to a large amount of memory, but the working set is quite small. 
right? Similarly, there's a concept called writable working set. So the set of pages which you write more most frequently is very small. Right? So it's only those pages that you actually need to send again and again. Okay, so now this sort of wraps up. Yes. Uh, doesn't the network take them remote only access for the network? Doesn't it take them latency from that? Doesn't it kill their application? It or makes it slow. It's better to page and stuff on your memory rather than copy stuff over the network every time you want to access a page. Right. So this is actually it's copying over the network for the first access of a page, right? So the first time you access a page from your source, you want to move it over the network. After that, it's local. But if it's a shared disk, why, not, why can't you just access? Oh, oh so this is for memory. Okay. We are assuming here that the disk is shared by NFS or something like that. Because sharing memory is still not that easy. Any more? Yeah. Why not like, we make a habit of both of them in the post? Store the memory, you know, like access memory in like an LRV basis and copy that. And Right, so people have developed, you know, that's, that, uh, that's a great point, people have developed sort of hybrid approaches where in post copy you're just sending the vCPU state, but you know the hybrid approach is you send the vCPU state plus a bit more of the most commonly accessed pages here, right? you have a longer downtime, but then you have less impact on performance. That's a great point. All right, so we're now going to switch tracks that covers migration, and this is now completely different on communication patterns and communication and distributed systems. The fundamental problem here is uh, we have distributed entities and you somehow want to share state information and information in general between these two entities. As a practical example, you may have a temperature sensor which has access to the temperature state and you have the climate controller, which may be running somewhere else, which wants access to that. So in this class, we're going to start looking at how distributed programs can do uh, this kind of state sharing and different means of uh, doing the state sharing. So, so the model that we are going to be using is the process model. We are assuming that you know, different entities are running as processes on presumably different systems or the same system. And because of process model, we are also assuming that processes are independent and sort of decoupled from each other. They have a single thread of execution and some local state. Right? And the challenge here is how do you get, how do you propagate state updates in process A's local state to process B's local state and other processes. So the two ways with which you can communicate at a very high level is that you can either transfer data or you can transfer data and control, which is where procedure calls come in. Right? Similar to how local procedure calls are able to transfer data and control from one part of the program to another via function calls. So there are two kinds of communication between distributed systems, within distributed systems that the book talks about. The first one is doing unstructured using shared memory and the other is structured. Let's take another example. So I have you know, two processes, doesn't matter what they are, and so, you know, in unstructured communication you use things like shared memory. So if you want to share the temperature, put you, know, you write your temperature is 72. And this is your sort of distributed shared memory. And whoever wants to read the temperature can simply do a normal uh, read operation. 
and treat it like a local variable. Uh, that's one way, it's sort of unstructured because you have no explicit way of knowing as a programmer what entities are trying to communicate what data with other entities, right? Because processes can write to this disparate shared memory and you know, when they're writing, what they're writing is not something that's very obvious. The other way, with the book called Structured, is using explicit messages. So instead of this shared memory, you get rid of this. And you simply directly send, you know, think big, send to this thing, and this may send an OK back, or whatever. It can be, both, it can be in, in, in both directions. So today we are going to look at this kind of message-oriented structured communication. And it's kind of, you know, we are doing this message passing over the network. And so this is networking 101. Uh, put here, so you put some message here, you know, but as it appears on the wire, it may be different because you put, you have all this whole protocol stack, all these transport, we have the transport layer and the data ring layer and all those things, which have to go in as actual payload over the network. So we, talk, we talked about this whole message-oriented communication, etc., and this is what the focus is. I think in the next few classes, you're going to cover uh, remote method invocation, which is way of distributed objects, and stream-oriented communication. So this might be familiar, but in this kind of a setup, you're doing explicit message passing you have an option of either sort of pushing or pulling, right? That's that's sort of conventional uh, conventional way to set things up. So in this push, we have something like you know update update temperature. It's a value. But in this pull model, it's more like your, you know, HTTP GET requests where you correction, say get temp, and then you'll return terms of value here. And this is a very common paradigm for designing communication patterns. You have look at two entities at a time and see how the state is propagated. So in this case, this is doing a push operation here, and in this case, you know, your sort of server is doing a get, and then your temperature, temperature sensor is actually returning the value. And what you use depends on your, you know, data traffic and where you want to save state and how you want to handle fault tolerance, and we'll encounter some of those issues as we go along this course. So this is this was like two at a time, and you can imagine communication scenarios in which you have like multiple clients. So you sort of broadcast or multicast your message, and that raises other concerns like how do you scale it and how do you order your messages in a group communication, etc. But today we're going to focus on this sort of point-to-point -point communication rather than any multicast techniques. All right. So, yes. Uh, it's it's a hybrid kind of a thing, right? Yeah, because you're still having this notion of who is able to receive your messages, but that happens at runtime. Right? That's more that's more dynamic than static. So, yeah. Any more questions on this high-level description of things? And I think. Things will become clear as we discuss concrete things like RPCs. So, why do we have RPCs? Right? First thing is that 
So if you want to transfer state and control in a local program, you use function calls. That's as simple as that. Uh, so the idea was in the mid 70s that, well, can we extend this paradigm to a distributed setup where you make a local call, right? But instead of going to a different part of your program, that call is being executed somewhere over the network by somebody else. From a programmer's perspective and from a designing perspective, right, an RPC is supposed to look exactly the same as a local call, right? Exactly the same. So you have parameters, function name, return values, the end. So the key challenge in RPCs is how do you design this infrastructure in order to work across a network right? and it is very difficult and in some cases impossible to make remote calls appear exactly like local calls for example you can assume that your local function call is going to run right you don't think of failure cases because it's the same program remote calls may have partial failures for instance right so we'll see what those issues are and how they are tackled in uh, RPC implementations in today's, today's class. So let's uh, you know see another example here. Uh, this is a function call here, update temperature. You send your device ID and temperature. It's a normal function call, no different from anything else. And you can also see things here, right? The fact that the thing in red is the RPC and everything else is a local call and there's no difference between how you invoke an RPC and how you invoke a local call, right? It's exactly the same. At least that's the goal and that's the intent of any RPC implementation. And, you know, this is, this is blocking, by the way, right? So, Local calls are blocking by nature. So if you call, it's a running example. If you have a local call, you know, whatever. Factorized number, you know, this will go in, we'll run this function, and some time, and you know, we have a, have a return instruction with the return value, right? So we don't think about this in a single threaded local context, but this is like blocking. RPCs are also are intended to be blocking, right? So even if this runs on a remote host, you're still expected to block. So if there's something else after this, so this is you know, line one, you get line two, and then on each other. Print value here. You're still expected to wait even though it's remote. So the key appeal of this RPC interface is that, you know, local calls and local function calls are well understood by programmers in order to structure their existing conventional non-distributed programs. The idea is, can we use the same, same techniques, right? Can we use the same function call techniques as a way to break down programs, but instead write a, a distributed program? In the in, in the process <clears throat> right so as I alluded to earlier there are a number of challenges which make uh, RPCs much more difficult to implement than local calls right? uh, we'll see some of these things but even simple issues like you know, how do you correctly pass function parameters over the network even those kind of issues uh, become quite challenging. So you may think about you know, what happens if uh, one of the parameters is a pointer to some memory address. And what are, what are the 
exact semantics around how do you pass that kind of state to a remote machine because you know each local state may not have right so your virtual address space is part of this process address space this part this process is local state which may not exist here right so you just can't pass like naked pointers and any fancy data structures right then the issue is you know we're dealing with failures and a well designed distributed system should be able to handle failures of some of its components right question is what happens when the remote uh, the remote end point dies while is executing this remote call what's the how does the client how does the client know that you know it's failed or what do you do i mean in in a local call you don't plan for this kind of a failure you assume that you get some value or an error right? but a failure is a different kind of thing you see all the issues which are arising in these contexts and lastly as an implementation thing you know rpcs are convenient if the rpc is indistinguishable from a local call from a programmer's point of view and how do you integrate rpcs in different languages and different uh, language runtime you need to sort of integrate this rpc layer into language runtimes and that itself is also quite challenging any questions on or concerns about how rpcs might work we'll see you most of these things in the rest of this class all right so as i said this you know blocking rpcs are the standard and when we talk about rpcs we talk about blocking rpcs and uh, although there are non blocking rpc implementations out there let's let's not confuse ourselves for now so this is a call site for the remote call you make a request on the server you wait for some time until you get a reply and you do that that's that's the standard timeline so now the question is okay we have this wish list we want to make local procedures and remote procedures the same or rather you want to make remote procedures behave like local procedure calls question is still like you know how do you how do you make it happen right that's uh, that's the key so there are two main components in an rpc implementation you have what are called code stubs and you have the rpc runtime and you can see how they interact and work with existing programs so let's see this picture uh we have the client process it's making a function called add takes two parameters i and j uh the intent is that this add process this add call is a remote call which is supposed to be running on the server right so the first step is that you want to wait let's have another <coughs> you have add i and j let's see what happens in a local call right let's let's forget uh distributed systems and remote process procedure calls and all that right i have this local function in my program you know k equal to i and j we have it here we have it here <coughs> we just see what happens from a normal language runtime point of view like c for instance So this is your program. This is the static representation. Then what's you know what does the compiler need to do? So, yeah. Well, first take all the temporary variables of the caller on the stack, right? And then put those variables uh, like i j put their values on the stack, mm -hmm. and then um, then jump to the procedure <coughs> where uh, where the code is stored, and then execute those codes. 
after that, yeah. uh, we publish that. Yes. So, well, step something later is. You know, but even before that, as a compile time thing, the first thing is symbol resolution, right? You need to know that this thing is a function call, and add refers to some function which is found somewhere, so you have to find that. So you need symbol lookup somewhere, and same thing for these parameters i and j, right? De depending on what kind of scope rules your language has. Okay, so that's the issues with local calls. Uh, with remote calls, it's similar, it's the same, all of these things, but a lot more. Things which are easier on a local system are much harder in this uh, distributed remote context. First of all, you need to identify that this is a remote call, right? You need to transfer, you need to add some more code to this, like a library function, to make sure that this can execute on a remote setup. And then copy the parameters to the network. Essentially, what happens is that you would want to serialize this call operation. So you create a packet, right? which contains information like what's the procedure that you want to call, in this case it's add, what are the parameters, I have two parameters, both are integers, let's say, right? so you ship this along to the remote end, or the server, which then has to unpack these things and execute the call in this local context, it returns the value, which again has to be packed and, sh and shipped back uh, to the client. So we'll see why we need to do this on uh, some more low level details on what steps are. Are things clear so far? All right, so the first challenge that sort of we encounter is how do you pass parameters? On a local setup, so said it's quite easy, you just save it on the stack. It is just a mem copy instruction. Um, in a remote case, right, you need to make sure that these things are passed by value. You can't allow references in a straightforward case. So what really happens is that So this is your this is your you know this is your source code. This is what you'll see add ij. This because it's a remote call, this will get translated. This is so this is basically call another function. Something like you know add let's just actually wait. <coughs> Client stub, <coughs> right? This will take in struct. Let's make a struct. Stream. What does this do? This client stub. This is the stub. This is called stub. And it's like a proxy. So, you know, this call is translated here, and this is over here somewhere. It will actually make the remote call, right? So this will. But before that, you need to make sure. You want to see what the parameters are. Actually, let's, let's, 
cutouts is sort of pack, you know, I and J for the network transfer. And other parameters like, you know, function name is add or that. And at this point, you know, you can say, let's say RPC call. is this and then you return v which will sort of go back to this right this rpc call is the one that actually you know sends over the network it, this is basically a network send right and this incorporates a lot of things like you know waiting for the reply and timeouts and all of the issues so it's lot more complicated than that. But so the stop code is basically a proxy for making your RPCs behave like local calls, but on the client, right, as local code, you're doing all this packing and unpacking, and it's called marshalling, in order to send this out to the network. Yeah? What's the difference between uh, stubs and uh, marshalling, like getting those two? Right, so the stop code is all the code, you know, which does a lot of things, like <coughs> marshal. That's one part of what it's doing, mm -hmm. right? The other thing it's doing is basically you know calling uh, the actual RPC runtime there on the remote end. And it can do a lot of things like you know authentication and throttling and so on. So it's, just, it's just basically act. So when you run, when you compile an RPC program, this code is generated for you, for every RPC that you have. Right. I think some of these things will become more clear as we go along and look at other examples. Right, so we talked about stubs, you know, which are like, so this is a standard, you know, fun, standard procedure, local procedure call in the language in which you're so this is just the same. And we have the stop compiler, which I'll show later, which will create, which will basically create these things for uh, your program. So this is another look at the flow, right? You create, let's see if this works. Right, so first call the client stop in a normal way, which is step one here. Right, this client stop will then build a message. Right, so we we are creating these parameters as function name as a message. So that's step two here. Since call the local OS, which is basically you're doing a network send here. That's step three. You know, then remote OS gives the message to server stop. So basically, it's the same process, but now in reverse, right? So you're going to collect it from the network to the server stop, which is going to then unpack the parameters and back to the server code and you know, back to the client. So this, is, so this is a recap of things which we discussed. Right, so let's uh, focus now on this marshalling thing. It, you may think of this as also as serialization. The fundamental problem is that you have these processes on different machines, which may be completely different. And you need to make sure that the data that you send over the network is consistent and can be parsed correctly on machines of different types. In the earlier days, the main issue was Indianness, right? You have little Indian and big Indian. So if you just send, even if you just send an integer, right, the, or, since the order of the bytes is different, if you just send it over the network, the other end, if it's a different, so Spark is, 
big Indian and I beam a little Indian, it's, you're going to get the wrong values. So you need some commonly agreed upon specification at both ends to say, look, we are going to use big Indian. So if it's a little Indian machine, you need to flip the bits before sending it out to the network. And this issue is simple in theory, but in practice, you may encounter a lot of issues of different languages and different runtimes and you know the size of the data types and the representation and stuff like that. You'll see a few examples on the way. So in RPCs, uh, in Sun RPC, the serialization format used is the XDR, the external data representation, which is a sort of cross-platform standard representation for transferring a lot of from a lot of languages to this sort of common serializable uh, standard. So let's see some of the fun issues uh, that may arise uh, when you're doing remote calls and why you need marshalling and why that's such a big uh, headache. Does this make sense? The overall flow, you make a remote, you make a local call, it tra gets translated to a stub, which does the marshalling for you, does authentication and other things, right? finally packs everything into a nice serializable message, sends it out over TCP or UDP to the remote end, right? waits for the result, when it has the result, unpacks it for you, and returns it to the local program like it was a normal local function call. Right? That's the overall flow. So we covered three, uh, the first issue was looking at you know, pointers, how do you marshal those? And what's the answer to that? It kind of depends, right? It depends on the RPC implementation and your language semantics. Um, in most cases, your, you know, the RPC runtime uh, D reference the pointers for you and sends the values after serializing them. But that's again, that's like a gray area, and you know. Second thing we looked at was MDNS. You need the machines, which may be different. And you know, all kinds of things. If you have structures. The binary representation of structures in memory depends on your word size, right? So, uh, this makes sense. Uh, like on a 32 bit thing, if I have a structure, uh, you know, on a 32 bit, it looks like this, I have C for 8 bits, this is uninitialized, right, to 32, because you have 32 bit names, and that have, they, they have started at 32 bit boundaries, that's I. Now, if you want to serialize, you know, if you want to marshal this structure, you need to be careful, you know, so the, you, you just can't transfer, you know, these 64 bits as a sequence of bits, right? even if they are both little Indian. Why? Because the other end may be a 64 bit machine, which you know expects. Let's just make this a pointer. Eight, and the other are all you know. Right, so. So this is like 32 bit wide, the 64 bit wide, you just can't send the same same byte stream from which is there in memory on one machine to another. So everything needs to be serialized and converted into this XDR representation or what else can we use instead of XDR? How do you serialize things in general? Yeah, exactly, right? So you have like JSON and XML. 
we look at other serialization formats later if get some time. Well, this makes sense. Like, why do you need to marshal? You know, it's different language semantics and all this. So the the RPC library and stub code have to make sure that this can be done for a variety of platforms, a variety of languages, even. All right. So we overlooked one part, which was. In fact, let's go here. We go look this part here, right? That when you say message sent across a network, whom do we send the message to? Right? The RPC server, but how do you know the location of the server? And this is the client code, right? Is that at IJ? That's all the information I have. And First, I need to know where there is a server on the network which is able to run this call for me, right? And that process is called binding. In initially, I was ex extremely confused why they call this binding. This is more like location service of sales. Yeah, or, yeah, or, or, or discovery. But this name is from standard programming languages, right? So you want to bind a symbol to its value, right? So you're trying to bind add to what it actually is and you know, what it actually stands for. And this binding, in this case, it's sort of over the network, right? You may have... So as a main challenge, how does a client locate a server for a particular uh, remote call? And how do they locate each other? So the way it works is that servers, you know, each, so, so the, uh, the other caveat is that, you know, both the client and the server have to have, during compile time, the information that this is uh, the RPC call that I'm going to export, you know, the server executes that and the client calls that, right? So that is shared information. And on the server, for each such sort of RPC call that it can service, it will export that information to a common, what's called a binding server or a port map daemon on, with uh, Sun RPC, right? So you th send things like the name of uh, the function call is versioning. They have things called unique identifiers because multiple programs can service the same call. And you know, what's the actual address which you can jump to? What's, what's the process which you can call in order to service this function. So from a client perspective, the first time you first time the stop calls this remote call, it has to do all this discovery of well, who do I call, right? So just like you have things like DHCP, there's port map daemon which also allows clients to find which servers are going to service what calls and then on that server you locate which program which version of the process, which version of the function, and so on and so forth. And <coughs> once that's done, you know, the binder in the client sort of binds the particular implementation to uh, to the stub, and after that, it's you don't have to go through this process every time. All right. All right, so this is the kind of structure that's exposed by every RPC server to this binding daemon. You have things like, you know, what protocol you're going to serve this on. So you have choice of TCP, UDP, something else. You have different uh, implementations for different protocols, right? Because they have different failure semantics. So the whole point is that this is a very flexible method. You know, you're not doing uh, too many things at uh, compile time. Right? And the key here is that uh, in many RPC implementations, and especially in Sun's RPC, a lot of these binding decisions are, you know, as dynamic as possible, right? which is sort of different from local programs in which you make binding decisions at compile time or late time. So, for example, you know, you want to be able to export different functions for the same uh, RPC, etc. And this can also sort of 
do a lot of other things like you know handle partial failures so because you're not tied to the same server endpoint if you get some failure you can try again right so the rpc library and the stub can do these kind of things for you right? and as a programmer still one call which you don't have to worry about and the sun rpc implementation can do a lot of fancy things like uh, load balancing in the binder layer itself and things like you know, request pipelining and result caching and all that so it's a very sophisticated system which tries to make decisions at runtime rather than forcing the programmers to make these decisions at compile time uh, questions certainly covered a lot all right so failures are another big aspect of rpcs and no as i said saying local calls resume will not fail uh, in a distributed setup you know your remote end may fail or you may have a network partition right and it seems it may have failed so you, you don't if you don't hear the response back what what does the client do and how do servers handle those kind of things right so we have you know client may be unable to look at the server or so network partition or some configuration issue in this case the rpc library just return error which is fine you may have lost request messages so you may never hear back acknowledgments about this thing it's possible that the server may execute So this is your RPC call. So this is your RPC request, and this is your server starts executing this. Right, so the three failure cases described there are: this may fail, in which case you return an error. In most cases, you're running something. This may fail. Right, that machine may just crash. You may not get this, the response back because of some network partition. So, from the server side, you have done the computation, you have returned it, you have marshaled all the return values, sent it to the network, it, it doesn't reach the client. So, from the client's perspective, that's a failure. And what do you do, right? Do you retry? So, you can send the same thing back if you don't hear this, you can send the same response back to retry, but then you will execute this again, even if this was executed. Right. Uh, what if this is incrementing some, some local state here, right? Or even worse, say, okay, you know, this thing and send email. Right, and, you're, and, and, and this is supposed to trigger only when some event happens. When you have this thing twice, because you're running it twice. Response. So these are all like failure semantics of what do you do, and like, in this case, so we, we talk about things like, you know, at least once, at most once, and no guarantee. <clears throat> so at least once, you know, clients can retry, which means the RPC library can retry, you don't, again, it's, it's, it's a local call, right? So from a programmer's perspective, you call add, the RPC library does this sort of retries for you, in most cases, but it leaves the flexibility to you. So if your function is idempotent, if, which means it doesn't have any side effects, so if it's something simple like, you know, just return square root, and this thing, it doesn't matter if you run it as many times as you want. So that's uh, at least once, which means you can try again. Uh, we generally prefer at most once, which means 
zero or one times three. So this is not supposed to happen. So instead, but how do you get at most one semantics? In many cases, the RPC library has a response cache. Right? So this response is just before being sent to the server, is also sent to this RPC cache. Right? And now when you retry, you're going to first check if this call was serviced from, you know, if this call was serviced by <coughs> this program or not. If it was, you don't execute this again. But you know, go to the cache and just get this return value back. And I think some RPC implementation has RPC cache, which again, remember this. So these failure semantics also depend on your transport protocol. Using TCP, that's a reliable end to end thing. So you may you see no, no instance of responses lost, they'll eventually reach you. You may have time out, but with UDP, you do need this RPC cache because responses can get lost, plans can redraw it, and what have you. And of course, in an ideal world, you would want exactly once, but that's pretty hard to achieve in a general uh, setup. How can you validate that RPC cache? Whether the client is calling the first time or it's purposely called the second time? That's a good question. So actually, which is why the, the the identifier number is there, and that also depends on your your program setup, right? Yes. Yeah. So in in general, you can't. So good. That's a good point. So at most, once will have it executed at most once it's possible that you may not execute at all so in that case you just return the client stub will just return failure right so in a local call you get some return value or some exception here it's your return value exception or failure just didn't work I mean, you can try again, right? Once you get a failure message, you can try again. But the issue is then it's from more programmer standpoint. Or if you, you know, you can try again on a different, you know, by binding to a different, different server. Right? That's always, uh, so it leaves the flexibility to the sort of programmers to, you know, see what, how do you handle failures at a more user level rather than at the RTC layer. Which is why it's more preferred because it gives more flexibility. So there are some other issues. Uh, you know, the client may fail. So this is the client, and you know, you make this request, and you get the response back, but sort of client doesn't exist anymore. It just died here. And then you know, there are some semantic issues here, like you are executing this computation for a caller which is no longer alive. Right? So in this case is this computation I referred to as orphans. And I think these issues are not as critical as server failures because you know there's no not too much harm, but you know some implementations may have some kind of polling mechanism in which you check whether the client is alive or not every T seconds or whatever. Yeah. Can you go back to previous? Sure. Thing? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about a reincarnation? I didn't get that. Right. So this is if if you don't. So this is you know once this is done, the RPC library is going to keep sending. Keep alive, kind of thing. Like, are you alive? So just keep alive. If you don't get it, you may want to re you may want to tell the RPC library on the other end to sort of start a, 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 another plan process to be able to handle the RPC response. So you tell the client to come back up again. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is implemented in, in any system, so I'll have to get back to you on that. I was actually curious about that word epoch. I've yes. seen that a lot of times. What does that mean? I think it's just a, a sort of a time unit. So 
think of this your epoch as maybe 10 seconds where so, so every 10 seconds you are So there's some issue with you know the different uh, more questions with you know like how do you send this over the network with TCP and UDP? TCP will have more uh, a bigger header but gives you end to end. UDP will have a smaller header so lesser overhead. Spe like especially if you have very small number of parameters, right? If you just have a couple of bytes, the TCP payload may be too much for too much overhead. And you know, RPCs all are always going to suffer from bad latency because there's just so much copying going on over the network, and even on the remote host, you know, you get the binder, you get you need to get from your network interface card to this RPC library to the stub to the actual program. So you know, it's not the best solution for latency in its most general. Uh, implementation. Right. Questions about C so far? All right. So let's look at Sun's. Let's look at an example of an RPC program. We're gonna make five first actually. Oh come on. So the key thing to note here is that you know you have you generate so this dot x is this XDR input format. And let's look at that. So dot x file. Right, so this is how you sort of define a remote call. You want to add, right? So your program, your program name, some version doesn't matter. This is the actual interface for the call, right? So you have function add, takes a pair of integers, that's a version, that's a version, that's another version number, ignore that. And you're defining this data type here as a pair of integers. So it's almost like a standard interface file. Once you compile this, you're going to get things like this. So this is basically the client stub, right? We talked about the client stub and RPC stubs. This is it, right? So this is this is the RPC client, right? You know, call the add function. XDR, remember, is this whole serialization format. So you're gonna first serialize your input, which is the pair of integers. The result also has things like timeout values, which are auto like automatically inserted. And if it's a success, you will you will return the result, right? If I'll have more things. This will sort of have, you know, how do you actually? So this is the header, the, the header file which is shared by both the client and the server, and you know, with the right parameters. So from so from the client perspective, right? From a programmer perspective, all you have to do is include the header file, which is generated for you automatically from the .x file, and that will have you know, add, that's it. Right? So this is this local thing. This is your RPC here, actually, right? It's like that. Right, so that's your RPC. This add underscore one is your RPC. It looks no different from other things. And right, no. 
this is another auto generated thing so this is this is like you know passing the message and closing the session error handling and so on this is, this is a, the, the stub code for the server side which involves a lot more stuff right you could you need to listen for connections you need to make sure that the arguments are correct and you have received everything and all that So you can see what uh, RPC uh, functions are sort of exported by the binder. So this is RPC info on my machine. You know, most things, this says what's the process identifier, what's the version, what's the uh, protocol that you're using, what address it's bound to, and you know, what's the name of the process using this. So on things like NFS servers, which uses uh, RPC for client server communication, you'll see a lot more of uh, these exported interfaces. Let's see. So we can run this RPC thing, this add server will just listen for incoming connections. And at the client, you know, you have to specify the server name in this case because we don't have a binder daemon set up. Just add these two values and yeah, it's good. You'll have to trust me on this that this is using RPCs or not. <laughs> uh. Right, so in sort of Sun RPC, you know, your client will first talk to the port mapper something you know once it's that number is bound which is like you know this program this version is for this port clients can then automatically just connect to that port and without going to this port mapper binder service every single time all right i think there's one more so you've seen this you start with this dot x file rpc gen creates all these dot c and dot h files for you so client sub client and server stubs and this xdr.c is just how do you translate from local to xdr representation all those routines and then that's it you have just run using both right so uh, so these days you know most like I was a show of hands how many people have already used RPCs and this is just a waste of time <laughs> all right uh, so what did you use Sorry? Wisdom, uh, web service, subscription. I see. Oh, you heard of that. So, uh, so the point is that, you know, Sun RPC is somehow going out of favor. And part of the reason is that it's too heavyweight, does a lot of things for you. And for most high performance programs, that's, that's overkill. Uh, so many distributed systems do use RPCs in some format, but you know, the RPC runtime library is most of the like in in too many cases is bespoke and like tailored for the application. So a common paradigm is to create these messages, serialize them in JSON or these days as protocol buffers. It is Google's binary serialization serialization format, which can just you know, space efficient and has support for lots of languages. And then basically just send that over HTTP. And you write, you use HTTP server libraries to process those requests and do your remote calls that way. I think that's, uh, that's the pattern which I think I'm seeing more uh, these days. And uh, so that's it. Uh, I'll be here for any questions or on migration. We have communication patterns and RPCs. Right. Any questions? All right. See you next time. Yeah.